Good afternoon. My name is Adrian Dix. I'm BC's Minister of Health. To my right is Dr. Bonnie Henry, BC's Provincial Health Officer. This is the, our COVID-19 briefing for Thursday, June the 4th. Uh, I say that we're honored to be here on the territories of the Lekwungen speaking people, the Songhees and the Esquimalt First Nations. Uh, there will be a written briefing uh, tomorrow, Friday at around 3 o'clock with uh, discussions of case counts and the other information that we provide on a daily basis. The following briefing to that will be Dr. Henry and I on Monday and next week's uh, briefings will take place Monday, Tuesday and Thursday. And uh, with that, today uh, Dr. Henry will start with a presentation that I think you'll see on your screen um, uh, and she'll take uh, you through a series of slides. After she's done, I'll have brief presentations on surgery, on the developments on surgery and on uh, seniors care on the single site proposal and then we'll be able to take questions. And with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Bonnie Henry. Thank you and good afternoon. Um, so today on, on June 4th, I'll give the numbers to start with and then we'll talk through uh, the, uh, some more of the epidemiology. So we have five new cases who have tested positive for COVID-19 and as of uh, today we'll also be including our epidemiologic link cases and we have four of those. Uh, those are all cases that we have um, been uh, counting since May 19th, the restart date. So in total we have nine cases uh, in BC bringing our total to 2,632 people in BC uh, with COVID-19. I will say with these four epidemiologically linked cases, they are all recovered, um, so they are not active cases at the moment. Um, so that includes now uh, in our, our health authorities, we have 909 people in Vancouver Coastal Health, 1,334 in the Fraser Health Region, 130 on the Vancouver Island Health Region, 195 people in the Interior Health Region and 64 people in the Northern Health Region. We have no new health care uh, outbreaks and six active outbreaks in, all in long-term care continue um, and rate, as of today we have 340 residents and 217 staff who have been affected. We do have uh, one uh, new community outbreak and as you know as we've been restarting we've been monitoring very carefully in our community. This one is at the Beresford Warming Center. It's a shelter in the Fraser Health Region and there are three confirmed cases and we're hopeful that that means that uh, the transmission is, has been limited um, and most of the cases are in staff. Uh, public health teams from Fraser Health are on site and actively investigating and tracing anybody who may have had contact. We also continue to monitor and support at the other community outbreaks that we have ongoing. So in BC today we have 201 active cases. Of those, uh, 26 people are hospitalized, six of whom are in critical care or ICU. And, and another positive note today, we have no new deaths in the province today. So 2,265 people have now fully recovered from COVID-19. I'd now like to uh, turn our attention to uh, our, our going forward uh, presentation. So this is uh, an update um, on the epidemiology in BC. I'm just trying to get myself organized here so I can see the slides. All right. So we've entitled this how and where the virus has affected people in British Columbia and we are going to be presenting some um, geographic data as well and we'll get into it. So this is a, a curve you've seen before. This is what we call our epidemiologic curve of the confirmed cases in British Columbia. Um, so we now have extended to the end of May um, on this curve and what you can see that's slightly different from what we've presented in the past is that we have our epi link to those purple bars um, cases noted as well and as I mentioned we started that on May 19th and we will be continuing to monitor that. So epidemiologic link cases are cases where somebody um, is a close contact of a person who has tested positive for COVID-19 and there's often Often um, there can be many reasons why they may not have been tested, uh, whether they had mild enough illness or they were identified at a time where their illness was uh, mostly recovered or that um, they weren't able to get uh, out of the house and uh, go to a place where testing was available. 
So those are um, numbers that will be helpful for us and cases for us to follow systematically going forward. The next slide gives you an idea of a, a, a smaller geographic breakdown than what we have been presenting so far. So we've been spending quite a bit of time making sure that we have this data available in ways um, that represent the impact of the, the pandemic here in British Columbia on the different geographic areas. And I will tell you that this is by what we call health service delivery areas. Uh, smaller areas than the health authority areas, but not as granular as I know many people would like. And we are working on how we can present this data in a way that gives you a better representation of the impact on smaller communities around the province. And we will be having that more granular data available publicly um, in the coming weeks. And so this does tell us, if we look at uh, the, the pink graph, um, the pink picture tells us that there have been no communities in British Columbia that have not been affected by COVID-19. Some of them more so than others. And this is not a surprise for any of us. We know that the cases that we've reported here that have tested positive, people who have had a test, we know as well that there was a period of time, particularly in March, when many people were coming back from travel, where we uh, um, did not have testing available as widely around the province, that there were many other people who also had this illness but are not yet represented in these numbers. And part of our strategy to understand that impact is to ensure that those people will be followed up on with serology testing as soon as we are confident we have a valid test. So it does tell us that, uh, as, as anybody who's been watching will know, um, that the Lower Mainland was disproportionately affected by COVID-19 um, with the outbreaks that we've had in long-term care um, in Vancouver Coastal, in the North Shore, and in the Fraser Health region. Um, this information is presented as a heat map um, by rates, so the number of cases per 100,000 population. On the right-hand side, the purple map, is the, uh, the same information presented as the number of cases per 100,000 population over the last two weeks. And as we can see, um, the, the number of cases has dropped dramatically across the province and the hot spots remain in the same areas, particularly in parts of Fraser Health. And those are related to the outbreaks that we have seen um, in our communities in long-term care over the last uh, few weeks and months. Uh, on the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about who this virus has been affecting. And so this is the COVID-19 cases by age and the proportion of people who are affected within each age group and the numbers on the top of the bar give you the, the number of people in that bar. So the, the things that strike us about looking at the age of people who have had the disease is that the majority of cases are people between the ages of um, 30 to 60. And really that reflects um, a lot of our working population, particularly healthcare workers. We also see that there's a very small proportion of young people who are affected. We had 26 children under the age of 10, and that's about 1% of the cases, and 51 young people between the ages of 10 and 19, so about 2% of cases. So that is uh, something that we have seen reflected around the world as well. So knowing that the majority of our cases are, are young adults um, between the ages of, of 30 and 60, as I've said, the next slide tells us a bit more about the impact of the disease on people who do get infected. Um, and this slide reflects the fact that it is as we get older that we're more likely to be hospitalized, to need ICU care, or to die from COVID-19. So the first um, set of bars on hospitalizations reflects that it is in the 60s, 70s, and 80s that people are more likely to end up in hospital. We do have had two people, uh, two children under the age of 10, which is about 7% of those children, but a very small number, and one person between the ages of 10 and 19 who were hospitalized. 
in the middle set of bars, we can see that the age moves up for those who required care in the intensive care unit to mostly be clustered around people in their 60s and 70s with a, a number of people in their 80s and 90s as well, including some that we know their stories um, that were in intensive care and uh, went home, which is the good part of that story. There were no people um, under the age of 20 who required ICU care. And if we go to um, the one bars on the right, uh, the people who have died from COVID-19, again, we see that it's heavily skewed to the older um, age groups, so our elders and seniors. And you can see that there's a big difference between people who have died and people who ended up in hospital. And much of that reflects um, the fact that this has caused many deaths in older people and our elders in our long-term care homes. Importantly as well, we've had two people in their 40s who have died from this virus, but nobody under the age of 40. And that um, is important for us to remember as well. Next, uh, presenting some information, and I've talked uh, about this before. So this is the number of people who have um, been infected with COVID-19 by sex. And as we can see, overall, it's fairly well balanced. Slightly more women than men uh, have been cases of COVID-19. And then in the next slide, it shows us the severity of illness. And this is something that is uh, that we've seen in British Columbia that reflects what we've heard in other parts of the world, uh, where men are much more likely to have uh, more severe illness that require hospitalization, ICU admission, or to die from COVID-19. And about two-thirds of those um, cases, um, hospitalizations, ICU care, or deaths have been in men compared to women. And this is something that we've seen in many other countries, and we've talked about the biological reasons why this might be. Um, we still do not have all the answers to that yet. Um, and it is interesting because uh, the, the numbers for Canada are slightly different, and those are heavily driven by uh, numbers of people who have died in particular um, in Ontario and Quebec, where there's a much more balance and uh, slightly more women than men. And really, I believe that reflects um, the number of, of women who are in long-term care homes and the, the, the numbers of deaths that have occurred in that setting. Uh, finally, just to give you a sense of the differential impact on our elders, um, this slide presents um, the proportion of people within each age group in the population, and we've presented this before. So we can see that about 10% of our population in BC are children under the age of 10, and only 1% of our cases are in that age group. And if we look up at um, people over the age of 90, we see that about 1% of the population are people over the age of 90. But that's uh, over 20% of the people who have died from COVID-19. The next uh, infographic, this slide presents some information that I'm, I'm very proud of. It reflects the work that has been done by the public health teams in British Columbia um, in, in doing the investigations and put some numbers to our case and contact um, tracing that we've been doing uh, in British Columbia over the past few months. So before March 15th, to start on the uh, far left-hand side, we had 1,257 case investigations or investigations that were initiated by public health. And that includes 1,000. history and contacting the contacts. 
So when I say on average they had 11 contacts, that means that many of them had, uh, many people who were infected had very few. They had one or two or even none, whereas some had many, and it was a, a much more detailed investigation. Of all of the 1,100 people plus um, who were contacts, close contacts of a case, uh, only 2% developed the illness themselves. So that's a, an important measure for us to understand as well. After March 15th, when we put in many of the public health restrictions, uh, we had considerably more cases. That was at the period of time where our, our outbreak was increasing. Um, and we had 11,000 uh, public health investigations, um, over 11,000, and over 8,665 contacts who were traced at that time. What we can see from this is once the restrictions were put in place, people had far fewer contacts, which made our work much easier. Um, so there was 3.6 on average for every case. And again, 98% of those people were reached within 24 hours, a really important feat. And it speaks to um, the, the, the teams that we have doing this important work. And after that, as we know, people had much more close contacts with their smaller circle or their bubble. So if somebody introduced the virus into their, their contact network, um, they were more likely to be exposed and to have the disease. And 7.4% of the contacts that we traced um, with these investigations became secondary cases, so became sick with the virus themselves. So that total tells us that um, over the 12,000 investigations, and I will say that this does not include the outbreak investigations that we did in places like long-term care. So it doesn't include those numbers that of people in long-term care um, or some of the other uh, closed settings uh, where we had outbreaks. But after. Um, after we put in the restrictions and people stopped having um, much larger groups and gatherings, um, we had a third of the contacts. And this is how we broke the chains of transmission in British Columbia, by reducing the numbers of people that we had close contact with and not giving the virus a chance to, to move to large numbers of people. And we reached a very high percentage of those contacts in a very short period of time. And I really need to, to give um, kudos to the public health teams around the province who did this work and helped us break the curve. The next I'm going to um, present some really interesting um, stuff <laughs> that we've been doing. Um, this is what we call genetic or genomic epidemiology. And this is some really uh, leading edge work that has been um, done out of the British Columbia Center for Disease Control with our laboratory team, the Public Health Lab and Genome BC. And it's work that we've been doing around tracing where viruses or bacteria come from to help us understand how people can be connected. And we've been using this type of analysis to help us with things like a tuberculosis outbreak that we had here in the province. But this is the first time that we've been able to rapidly sequence genomes to help us understand the trajectory of our pandemic in a very short period of time. So what you see here with all these lovely colorful dots is uh, about 700 to 800 of the, of the uh, viruses that have been isolated from swabs taken from people. And the genome of the virus, so the RNA, the genetic material of the virus, has been sequenced to help us understand where it's, it's closely related to. And what happens is uh, viruses, when they replicate, they change slightly. This is not a very fast changing virus, um, so we can tell it, uh, when, where it's come from by how many changes there are in the genetic pattern. And then we share those around the world and we compare and we can see where somebody may have originated or where the virus may have originated that then came into British Columbia. And along the bottom line, we have a, a, a timeline. So our first cases came in, in British Columbia in uh, middle of January when we first had a test for this. And they are this, uh, what we call the B3 lineage, so mainly from China. Not surprisingly, that is where our importations came from, and that follows with our, our traditional epidemiology, where we knew people had traveled in from places in China, and the virus that we isolated is very similar to the ones that were coming from Wuhan province, for example. Um, as we went along, 
we had a new introduction of a virus, a kind of a, uh, the green one near the top, and the B4 strain via Iran. And we know, uh, you will recall, that was early in February when we had an unusual event, what I called uh, a sentinel event or an indicator event. And that was we identified a, a person who had not traveled anywhere near China, who had come back from, a, from Iran. And uh, the, the testing that we did at the time showed that she did um, have um, uh, COVID-19. And this was before Iran had uh, notified the World Health Organization and people were aware that the outbreak was happening there. So doing the genome sequencing at the time helped us really confirm that, yes, this virus was quite different from the viruses that we were seeing coming in from China. And we had seen quite a few of them, and they weren't spreading too much. So we saw this new genome sequence come in, and it turned out to be very highly correlated with the genome sequences that were circulating in Iran once we had that information as well. So it was one way of helping us confirm those links. Finally, we. Uh, the next uh, event that we had is some of these um, um, uh, fuchsia, really <laughs> colored um, dots, and what we call European like and Eastern Canada. Um, so the initial ones for us were ones that came from, uh, that were introduced during a, a conference that was held in Vancouver. And we had a number of cases arise from contact in that conference. And one of the people that we knew was positive and had attended that conference had been um, previously in Germany during his incubation period before he became ill. And so the viruses that we were seeing that came out of that conference uh, reflected their European origin. And they were more closely related to virus sequencing that we were seeing in Germany and Italy and France. Um, we know from this genomic sequencing that was done, once we started to see many more cases come from that conference and being associated with that conference, and as you know, we had 87 at least in BC that we know, um, there were likely several people who had attended that conference that were ill because we found three slightly different strains of a virus related to people who become sick in that, uh, uh, from attendance at that conference. So this is a really nice way of helping us put together our basic epidemiology with understanding how people can be connected. And all of them were European strains that were slightly different. Again, it tells us the, the risk that we have of uh, congregating together when this virus is circulating, even anywhere in the world. And finally, we have a whole cluster of cases that are related to what we call Washington State. So that's the A1, um, the, the turquoise-colored um, virus lineages. And those, of course, well, you will remember were a, a lot of what was happening in Washington State very much affected our pandemic here in BC. And so with that, I'll just, the next slide shows this in a slightly different way. And so this is, again, timeline along the bottom, and it shows that we had many introductions early on, but mostly they were linear. They didn't cause a lot of exponential growth, so they weren't being transmitted. And that is partly because people were um, self-isolating as soon as they got ill, and partly with the work that we were doing in public health to trace people and, and um, break those trains of, chains of transmission. What we do see is around March 10th, um, time frame there, we had a, a, an increase, a steady and rapid rise in the Washington State-like um, virus strains that we were detecting. And that really reflected people coming in from Washington State or us going back and forth across the border and um, bringing the virus back. And then it's seeding outbreaks in our community and in our long-term care homes. The fuchsia, again, the European-like, um, again, we had a rapid rise in those around the same period of time. Many of them related to the conference and then transmission within our community here. And as we went forward, people returning to British Columbia and Canada from other parts of the world. So this is just a, a, a pictorial representation using the virus genomes that help us understand how our pa pandemic progressed here in BC. 
And finally, just to round the same thing, this is the geographic distribution of where those viruses um, were found more frequently. So we, this is by health authority again, and the size of the, uh, the uh, circle reflects the numbers of cases that we're seeing in each area. So you can see in Fraser Health, there were a lot of the European, Eastern Canada related strains. We're in Vancouver Coastal, Washington State, and again, reflects what we um, just talked about, how um, excuse me, people coming in with the virus back and forth across Washington State seeded some of the outbreaks in Vancouver Coastal. And in other parts of the province, there was very much a mix. It was related to um, people who attended uh, the conference that we're talking about in the north and in Vancouver Island and the interior, also related to people returning from travel from many parts of the world. We know there was a, a number of clusters of cases related to people returning after cruise ships. Um, the cruise ship outbreaks, we know we had clusters related to uh, people, uh, temporary foreign workers coming in from Mexico. And those are reflected in the other colors that are in the, those, um, those circles. So that's kind of an exciting and innovative way that we have been using the genome sequencing to help us understand the epidemiology in British Columbia. And we will be able to use it as we move forward through our pandemic um, to be able to, to pinpoint where people might have picked up their virus if cases arise in our community that aren't linked. All right. Next, uh, we'll just go on very quickly to slides that you have seen before. So this is our curve, our pandemic curve. So these are the case rates. So the rates of cases per million population in British Columbia compared to the rest of Canada and to uh, a number of other countries around the world. And we have, by the work that people have done here in BC, maintained a very flat case rate across some um, and, and co comparable to many other countries in the world and uh, certainly compared to many of our um, other provinces in Canada, particularly Ontario and Quebec. And uh, the second part of that is looking at the, the rates of deaths per million population. And you can see Canada, uh, um, the rest of Canada and, and a number of other countries compared to BC and BC compared to a number of other provinces. And again, it reflects what we have done to try and minimize the impact of this virus um, on our populations here in British Columbia. So finally, I'm going to go through a number of the models, uh, the first of which you've seen before, and it is to let you know what we have been watching and what we will continue to watch as we go through BC's restart. So we have been watching um, our mobility, where people are going, and comparing that to our pre, um, uh, the pre-restrictions or public health measures that were enacted in March. And this tells us that uh, we continue to gradually increase our contacts in the community in terms of retail, workspaces, um, and transit, that we continue to have higher levels in our residential areas, meaning we're staying at home more frequently, um, and our groceries and pharmacy contacts have gone up back to um, pre-COVID rates. As well, we can see that uh, uh, people going to parks has increased, and particularly in the last couple of weeks, which is actually nice to see uh, since the parks have opened again. So this is part of the information that gets fed into our dynamic compartmental modeling that we've talked about before. And this is the updated model that uh, we've, we've used to help us understand what we're doing, um, how we're getting along with the physical distancing, and help us understand what could happen um, with scenarios in the future. So this model, um, it has our cases plotted against the, the model, and it does suggest that our continued declines in transmission, and it re reflects the fact that we continue to uh, pay attention to our physical distancing, to staying away when we're ill, to doing the measures we know um, prevent transmission in this province, and that we are continuing to track that in the right manner. So we are we remain around um, 30 to 40 percent of our pre-COVID contacts, and that's what we want to stay at. We want to stay somewhere around 50 to 60 percent, 
And we know that if we do that, we're likely to, to have low numbers of cases over time and not to have any exponential growth in our, um, in our trajectory here in BC. And this is uh, some of the projections from the modeling that tells us what could happen if we um, take away too many of our, our control measures, our protections, our safe distancing too quickly. So if our contact rate increases to 70 percent, we are likely to see a, a rapid growth. And 80 percent, we might see a rapid rebound in transmission in a very short period of time. So that is why we are taking our, our thoughtful and measured approach to our restart here in BC. And there are two ways that we can protect ourselves. One is by reducing the numbers of contacts, and we're talking about that with keeping our, our groups small, the importance of not uh, inadvertently transmitting to large numbers of people. And we have seen some of that happening um, in workplaces, in family gatherings, um, even in the past few weeks. The other part is to ensure that when we do have those contacts, that they are protected, which means that we either have physical barriers, we have low numbers of people, we maintain our safe spaces, and we don't go into any place where we'll have contact with others if we're feeling unwell ourselves. Finally, um, I wanted to present a new type of modeling that we've been looking at uh, over the past number of weeks, and it's what we call age-structured modeling. So it's based on real data about how different age groups interact in, in BC, and it was a model that was developed by uh, BC CDC and UBC and, and a number of years ago to help us understand uh, influenza transmission and things that might work in influenza. So our researchers have been working to understand how we can use this structured model um, to understand impacts of things like schools reopening. So this um, bunch of squiggly colored lines tells us uh, quite a lot, actually. Um, what it tells us is that we know that children, and we've talked about this, are less likely to get infected with COVID-19 for reasons that are probably related to the receptors, etc. cetera. Um, but even if children were 100% susceptible, meaning that they had the same risk as adults of acquiring the illness, opening schools will have a minimal impact on transmission in our province as long as we continue to do the things that we're doing. So this is reassuring to us that even in the worst case scenario where children have the same way, rate of transmission as adults, that reopening of schools is not something that we would expect to, to cause rapid growth. As long as we are continuing, particularly adults, continuing to maintain our safe distances and to ensure that our schools are equipped to prevent transmission to the greatest extent possible. And finally, um, we also use modeling to help us say, okay, what's the worst case scenario? If this happens, what could potentially happen? So as schools reopen, and even if all schools were open and all children were in, if we relaxed our, our um, distancing measures, as long as we were fastidious about staying away if we are ill, whether it's children or adults in particular, um, then we still would be able to, uh, we would prevent a rapid increase in epidemic growth. So these are the types of things that help us um, give evidence and data to support how we need to do things going forward. And these are the things that we will be following. We'll be following what's happening in schools over the next couple of weeks. And we'll be following um, the transmission patterns that we're seeing in our community uh, over this, the second incubation period since our restart. And this is the data that will guide us to when we can move into the next phase of uh, restart here in British Columbia. And I'm going to leave it. Well, I think I'll say one more thing. <laughs> Just that, you know, this, this, our approach moving forward is, um, is really, uh, my, my new mantra is minimize, manage, and modify. So we want to minimize the number of new cases. And that means the things that we are doing and have in place now. We need to actively and very quickly, nimbly manage cases and clusters with rapid contact tracing, and that's the work of public health. And we need to modify our measures as needed. And that may be opening up things more. It may be looking at different ways of doing things. But we all know that we need to assess our risks every day, every step. 
and we need to follow our rules. We always, always, always need to stay home and away from others if we're sick. We still need to keep our, our connections and our contacts and our bubbles small. Not having large gatherings is incredibly important, and we had a reminder of that in the last week, where we've had um, somebody inadvertently and bring it into their close family, and we've had a transmission to a number of people. This is what we know from this virus, that we pass it on to the people we are closest to. And these are the measures that we need to take to ensure that we protect our families and our communities. We are all concerned about demonstrations that have happened that will trigger a surge in cases, and we are watching very carefully for that. I regularly speak with my colleagues across the country and to the south of us, and we are all watching these things. We know there continues to be transmission at a fairly high level in Washington State. Um, we know that uh, across the country we are continuing to see cases. So we are not immune to bring it, people bringing it into um, British Columbia. We know we have travel. We know we have travel into the province that's essential in many cases, and sometimes that can bring risk with it as well. Um, these, so whether we are at work, whether we are thinking of participating in a peaceful demonstration, we need to continue to remember small numbers, keep our distance, and stay home, even if your symptoms are mild. And this is, you know, this no one intends to pass the virus on, but we know that when it happens, it's those closest to us who are most at risk. We all have a role to play in continuing this, our pandemic response in BC, and what we do today will make that difference for the coming weeks. So please continue to be kind, to be calm, and to be safe. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Henry. And uh, uh, you'll know that the copy of the presentation for members of the public who are interested, and I know many people are, will be available both at the BCCDC website and linked to our uh, statement today. So I'm, I'm, uh, I encourage you to take a look at it in detail, uh, look at the slides in detail. I'll just make a couple of points briefly about those slides. That, as uh, uh, Dr. Henry has said, one, it demonstrates why we have to continue uh, to be, in particular, I think, vigilant at our borders. If you look at uh, um, slide four, it will show that uh, in that period, that last two-week period, which led into, I think, in the slides, May the 29th, the last two periods covered in the slide, there was 144 cases over two weeks in British Columbia. That's roughly 10 cases a day in that period. In the last week, uh, at the end of May and the beginning of June, there were thousands of cases in Washington State in the thousands, in the thousands in Ontario, in the thousands in Quebec. Not so long ago, the largest outbreak in North America uh, occurred at a business in Alberta. So what this tells us is that our measures and the importance and the continuing importance of measures involving quarantine and self-isolation when people return uh, to uh, British Columbia, Canadians return to British Columbia are key, and measures at the border continue to be key for us as we maintain and avoid further transmission of COVID-19 in BC. Secondly, I think you see throughout these slides and throughout the results from the discussion of contact tracing to the evolution of uh, COVID-19 uh, transmission in BC, the impact of what all of people, all the people watching us and all the other people, all of their neighbors in BC have done. The decisions that people have made on an individual basis have had an effect and you have seen that in the flattening of the curve. You have seen that in the control of COVID-19 in relative terms in BC, notwithstanding uh, circumstances. But circumstances occur. We talked about Washington State, and if you look at slides 11, 12, and 13, you see this. If you uh, go back and look at the slides, you see that in Vancouver Coastal Health, where the early transmission occurred at the beginning, you'll know that the most greatest number of cases were in Vancouver Coastal Health, and that was linked to transmission from Washington State, and that was linked to care homes still. Uh, the majority of deaths in British Columbia due to COVID-19 are in Vancouver Coastal Health. You see that the impact of this thing and why it, it continues to be our responsibility as a community and our responsibility as individuals to support one another and to ensure 
and to prevent transmission of COVID-19 and that responsibility and the needs for measures like or restrictions on the size of gathering, the need for measures such as self-isolation and people returning to BC is as strong now as it has ever been. I wanted to update you um, with respect to um, uh, two issues that we update every Thursday. The first is surgeries. Um, and uh, we have a very positive re report about the extraordinary work being done in every single health authority in British Columbia. I just want to put it in context. In the high period of COVID-19, after we had fully ramped down and delayed elective surgeries, we averaged in that period from uh, March the 23rd to uh, May, the, May the 17th, we averaged in that period about 2,400 surgeries a week in that period. Um, this past week, uh, the week from May 18th to 24th, as you recall, that came up to 3,961 surgeries. This week, uh, the number of surgeries was 5,174. And to put that in context, given the challenges with respect to productivity um, uh, that COVID-19 brings in our acute care settings, we average around 6,000 surgeries in the pre-COVID period in a week, both urgent surgeries and, uh, and, scheduled, and scheduled surgeries, which are sometimes called elective surgeries. So we're getting closer to that number with 5,174 this week. And I wanted to congratulate everyone involved. I wanted to note that surgeries take place at 59 public facilities in BC and elective or scheduled surgeries are taking place in all 59 now. They also take place in the public health care system under the Medicare Protection Act, the Canada Health Act at um, eight private sites. Seven of those are operating at full contra contracted capacity as we speak. The only one that isn't quite there yet is Falls Creek Surgical Center, which just rejoined us recently. And we expect them to be back with the rest of the system at 100% in the middle of this month. I wanted to just uh, briefly update you on the single site initiative. Um, there is some, again, some slight change in the numbers where we've, we added, uh, we counted twice a site which had a long-term care facility and an assisted living facility. We brought those together uh, under one site. So we're now down to 526 sites. It was originally 545, then 533, I think, last week, and now 526. So it's fully implemented at 493 sites, primarily the sites where it is not implemented. Those 33 sites, the majority of those sites are assisted living sites. There are only now uh, five long-term care sites in the whole province that have not implemented the single site plan. I just want to put it in context because that's the number of sites, but talk about how many workers we're talking about. There are 48,794 workers working at the impacted sites, the 526 sites. Uh, 39,576 were working at only one impacted site. Um, so 8,878 workers were working at multiple sites and that number now, those that have been assigned to work at a single site is 8,495, so almost all and the ma majority of the small number that have not been assigned yet are in assisted living and those are primarily on Vancouver Island and I think this is both an important step we've taken and a remarkable achievement that uh, that's, that's happened in the context of COVID-19 in the last number of weeks. And it's because we made the decision to level up, as you know, uh, hourly wages uh, to union wages in accordance with the terms of this, uh, with single staffing. I know jurisdictions have uh, proposed and even uh, ordered single site staffing, but to make it happen requires ensuring that workers are treated both fairly and appropriately. And that's happened in BC. I think it's an enormous achievement. Those workers will start to see uh, in the middle of June that reflected retroactively in pay and they will be informed about those changes at that time. But uh, from the time of the order uh, where the single site uh, was put in place at their facility, they will receive um, compensation accordingly. So in closing, today's session offers another powerful reminder that there are steps we can take to stop the spread of COVID-19. Single site staffing, that helps. Limiting international visitors at our border, that helps. Dr. Henry's measures, that helps. Maybe that even helps quite a bit. Aggressive testing and contact tracing, that is remarkable work. That is the everyday work of public health that we have come to acknowledge and recognize and maybe even celebrate just a little bit. But that the core of all these successful actions, at the heart of our success in BC, COVID-19, is us. Our success in stopping the spread, in moving through phase two and perhaps beyond, our success in keeping
ourselves, our elders and those we love, rests on us. It still does on our personal commitment to physical distancing, on our personal action to maintain it in the weeks and the months to come, on knowing we should stay home when we're sick and doing just that at the first sign of symptoms. There are a lot of things that others can do that shape the spread of COVID-19. But within our individual and collective power in BC, the steps we can take ourselves offer us the strongest protection and the greatest chance to stop the spread. Physical distancing, that saves lives. Staying home when we're sick, that saves lives. Coughing and sneezing into our sle sleeves, that saves lives. Washing our hands, it saves lives. We've proven that we will take the actions necessary to stop the spread. What we might not think, but we need to know with 100% certainty is that our actions save lives. That's our contribution, all of our contribution to our BC effort. That was, that's what must be our conviction in the weeks and months ahead. That's what being 100% all in in our COVID-19 effort means. Stopping the spread, saving lives. It continues to be true today. Aujourd'hui, nous annonçons cinq nouveaux cas pour un total de 2632 cas de COVID-19 en Colombie-Britannique. Il n'y a aucun nouveau décès lié au COVID-19 et je m'en réjouis pour un total de 166 décès en Colombie-Britannique. Nous continuerons euh, d'offrir nos condoléances à tous ceux qui ont perdu leurs proches. Parmi l'ensemble des cas confirmés de COVID-19, euh, 26 personnes sont actuellement hospitalisées, dont 6 en soins intensifs. Les autres personnes dont le test de dépistage a été positif sont en isolement à leur domicile. Thank you very much. I know that was a long go, but we're looking forward to uh, take your questions. Thank you. As a reminder to everybody on the phone, please press star 1 to enter the queue. You are limited to one question only. Please also take your phones off mute. You will not be audible until I call your name. First question is from Lisa Usda, News 1130. Dr. Henry, look at these percentages saying that we're at 30 to 40 percent now. What happens at 50 per 60 percent? What happens at 70 percent? What will it take to either halt moving into stage three or phase three, as we're hoping in a week and a half, mid-June? What will it take to pull back from that? I'm just wondering what the triggers would be to change the path that we're on. Like, is it a number? Is it a percentage? Is it a pace at which cases are growing or transmissions are growing? <laughs> you probably understand when I say it's it's a little bit of everything. Um, uh, as I've been saying all along, uh, it is the combination of those. Yes, if we start to see rapid increase in uh, certain areas, and you know, our intent is to ensure that we we know more now. And I've said this before, we, we didn't know anything about, we didn't know very much about this virus when we put in place these measures in March. We know now how we can control it. So I want us to continue. We're watching um, numbers of cases. We're watching outbreaks. We're watching clusters. Catching them early is really, really important so that we don't have broad transmission. So uh, unlinked cases in our communities is something that I'm watching every day or we're watching every day. Those are um, worrisome signs. What I do think we have in our favor uh, is knowing um, how we're doing things around the province is I do not expect that we're going to get that rapidly explosive growth that we have seen in other countries. Um, if we continue to do things the way that we have. I always am concerned, and I mentioned it because uh, my colleagues in the U.S. when we were talking early this morning, we, we all have the same concerns that if we have large gatherings together and somebody seeds the virus to large numbers of people who then go back to different parts of communities, and different parts of the province, um, that can put, set us back quite a bit. So those are the things what we'll be looking for. Cases rising without connections, without links in different parts of the province. Those are the most worrisome things that we'll be seeing. Next question is from Shannon Patterson, CTV. Oh, hi, Dr. Henry. Thanks for taking my question. It's actually not about modeling. Um, some restaurants that have spent a lot of time and money on reopening two weeks ago are now struggling to attract customers. And they're really wanting you to come out and make it clear that it's safe to dine out again. They'd like to see you strongly encourage the public to return to these restaurants that have spent all the time and money getting physically distanced. Uh, is that something you're prepared to do? Absolutely. I think I have said that I have been out to uh, one of my favorite restaurants, one of the ones that kept me going with takeout over the last uh, 
uh, the last few months, and I intend to continue to do that. You know, part of what we do in terms of presenting this data, helping people understand what we're looking at and why we think it's okay, and also, you know, that what we have been doing around um, coming up with the plans, the COVID safety plans that have those. Um, uh, those requirements, uh, the, the public health stamp of, a seal of approval, if you will, is to do just that, to build that confidence. If people have a plan, they've thought about it, they're doing what we need them to do, then we know that those environments will be safe. And, and yes, I do encourage people. It'll be different, and it'll take a little bit of, of uh, it'll be a little awkward at first, at least it was for me, a little anxiety provoking. But you know what? It was great. And it, we need to get back to those social connections that are done in a safe way. And I do encourage people to, to go out to those restaurants who have taken the time to develop a plan to do it right so that they can protect staff and they can protect our customers and that we can have some growth, particularly you know, our small um, businesses, our small restaurants, our restaurants who are missing us and the people um, who have been off work for this period of time. So yes, I strongly endorse people going out and uh, doing it in a safe way. Next question is from Tanya Fletcher, CBC. Hi, Dr. Henry. Um, looking at the virus origins from the modeling, is it a surprise travel from China wasn't more significant in terms of infections? And conversely, why were cases from Europe and Eastern Canada ultimately that much more significant? And sorry, just one more uh, kind of sidebar. Uh, considering how well Richmond has done, uh, zero cases there since at least mid-May, with the large Chinese population there, is there since perhaps the community's focus early on with voluntarily adopting measures like masks and self-isolating that that might have helped keep those numbers down? Uh, and any answers in French would be appreciated. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I absolutely um, think that that is part of it. Um, I, I think our, our approach early on, when we know that most of the introductions into BC and into Canada and everywhere else in the world were coming from China, where we were uh, working with the community, where the community themselves in, in BC took this very seriously, where we supported people, and we talked about it in, uh, in January and February about community activities to support people people coming from China to self-isolate. Um, and we in public health uh, made sure that people who came in who had symptoms were tested, that we targeted our testing on people we knew were at risk, but that we had a broad, um, broad uh, um, target uh, testing a strategy way back then. You may remember that we encouraged anybody who was concerned, and that's how we picked up um, somebody who had uh, picked up the virus in Iran. So yes, I do think those made a difference. We um, Once we started to get a lot of floods of cases, if you will, um, it became much more challenging to find people. And there was a time when people didn't realize the risk that uh, was uh, that came from other countries. It, we were still very much focused on on um, the the outbreak that was happening in China. Um, so yes, once uh, once we started to get lots of, of of viruses introduction from back and forth across the U.S. border, so it wasn't just Washington; it was other parts of the U.S. as well. Um, it became much more challenging to find people, and we know that there now now that there was uh, there can be transmission from people. Um, before or just before they show symptoms or early on in their illness where they may not recognize it. So the European ones are, are a combination. And again, the first part of it where we started to see dramatic increase was really introductions in large events like uh, the conference that we were talking about, but also people returning from travel to Europe. Um, and this is one of the issues that uh, we uh, recognized in Quebec, where there was a lot of travel back from France when it was not really realized what was going on there and how broad there was community transmission. So that's where, uh, when you see lots of dots, it's because it's being transmitted in the community here. So uh, for us, you know, that was our key period of time where we were having both happening at the same time. Um, and uh, the rest of the country, very similar, I think, where uh, they had a uh, dramatic increase in transmission in a very short period of time. And the measures that we put in place across the province were the ones that protected all of us. Next question is from Fran Yanor, the GOAT. Oh, hi there. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister and Dr. Henry, for the briefing. Um, my question relates to the single site 
uh, particularly long-term care, which I believe is unprecedented, and correct me if I'm wrong, for Canada and certainly rare globally. Just uh, wondering, other jurisdictions have indicated an intention towards this but haven't managed it. Why is BC succeeding and what have been the most significant challenges, the pushbacks in the system that you found uh, to implementation? You know, I, I, I'll let Minister Dix answer that, and I know I uh, just remembered you uh, the previous question they answered asked oh, for en French. Français. En français. Okay. Uh, I think what was significant is the almost immediate uh, identified, uh, identification of this as, as an issue. In the first, in the first half of March, uh, this was identified as an issue as we saw transmission building in the first cases uh, in long-term care, uh, in particular at the Lynn Valley Care Home and the Harold Park Care Home. And I really give credit to our people in public health. This is an issue, um, the issue of, of uh, workers in long-term care and long-term care that has been working on for a long time in BC. But I think early on and very quick action was taken on sites where there were outbreaks. And this was led by Dr. Henry and Dr. Patricia Daly in Vancouver Coastal Health, in particular, I think I can give particular credit for who identified this. And why we've been successful as we proceeded, it wasn't just public health orders, but it was action, significant action by government to see that it happened and to see it through. I mean, it required, of course, uh, so far, the assignment of 8,495 workers to a single site and significant changes with respect to remuneration. And I think what we had in BC was outstanding action by public health, and still 96 people have passed away in long-term care, let's be clear. Outstanding action and cooperation from uh, care providers, both uh, private and health authority owned and operated, private facilities uh, that offer care and almost all offer public beds. Uh, outstanding work by uh, unions which committed themselves to the process and committed themselves to helping the residents they served. This was a Team BC approach uh, involving seniors care that was required in every area. So our early action on, earlier action on PPE, that was a partnership of unions, of uh, care providers and of government. Our early action in terms of measures to stop visitors and from visiting, which is a very challenging action and what we continue to review. The actions that were taken by infection control and actions such as single site, I think together what they showed uh, and what they demonstrated, I think, was uh, the commitment of the entire sector to work together in BC, a Team BC approach. And um, even though, of course, there have been serious consequences uh, that resulted from COVID-19, which has caused difficulty around the world, I think our determination to act and then to follow through has had a really positive effect and will have a long-term po positive effect on the quality of change. There is more to do. Anyone who understands the long-term care sector in BC understands that capital improvements are required, particularly in the health authority owned and operated areas where the average building, um, building age is 34 in the health authority owned and operated part of the sector and that's uh, for buildings that are used so intensely over long periods of time is a, fair, is a high average and this uh, affects the facilities index and the need to continue to recruit people to be part of this sector and I'm hoping that part of the recognition and celebration of healthcare workers will inspire a new generation of people to do this work. Uh, en français, uh, sur la, la, la dernière question, question sur la, la question de, de ce qu'il fallait faire ici en Colombie-Britannique uh, pour restreindre la transmission de COVID-19, je pense que ce qui est, est important uh, en premier, c'est l'action de, uh, de la grand pub, du grand public, mais aussi de, des gens, des gens qui travaillent dans la, dans la santé publique en, en Colombie-Britannique. C'était surtout le cas au mois de février, au, mois, au commencement de mars, où on a travaillé si fort pour trouver des cas et pour éliminer la transmission, ce travail qui est fait par les gens qui travaillent dans le domaine de, de, de la santé publique est un travail héroïque qui a, qui a quand même démontré euh, sa, son valeur pendant la, cette période. Parce qu'on est arrivé au mi-mars quand il fallait faire des mesures très strictes euh, dans une, une meilleure position que d'autres juridictions et on a, on a pu quand même euh, euh, mettre en place des changements et des efforts euh, du, du grand public qui a, 
qui a quand même euh, réussi en quelque sorte à, à restreindre la transmission de COVID-19. Next is Richard Zussman, Global News. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Dr. Henry, based on the data you're looking at here, is it clear that the Pacific Dental Conference was the one singular event that had the greatest impact on the spread of the virus in our province? And on slide 17, the British Columbians' mobility in terms of the trend of people doing things, is there anything that stands out to you and surprised you from that data? Uh, in of the, the, the conference, um, not, it's not the only event. We've had many, uh, I mean, the largest outbreaks have been related to our federal correctional facilities. We've had transmission in communities. Um, it was certainly um, an event that seeded a number of different areas of the province um, at a critical time when we were also um, getting a lot of transmission related to uh, travel back and forth across our borders. So um, it, it was timing as much as anything. Uh, I cannot uh, say that it was the only thing that caused our pandemic by any means. Um, it was certainly a sentinel event or an important event in uh, the timing of it um, along with everything else. So would we have still had uh, the, the transmission that we had? Probably. Um, we did recognize it relatively early, and you may recall that uh, you know we I yeah, ordered people who had <laughs> just uh, at this podium um, who had attended the dental conference to self isolate when we knew that there was at least um, uh, at that point it were six cases associated with the conference. We didn't know all the details then, so I think we took action quite quickly, or it could have been even more impactful uh, across the province. Um, in terms of the mobility, um, you, you know what? I just uh, I, I think what I've seen is a slow, steady increase, and it doesn't surprise me so much as just make me uh, make me thankful that people are taking this seriously. They're taking it slowly, but we are getting back to making our connections, and I see that our, myself when I'm out and and around. Um, and that the fact that we've continued to uh, go to our parks, I also think that's good. Uh, I was a little bit surprised at the big jump because I thought people were actually using the parks pretty much. But I, I think uh, the fact that the provincial parks were mostly closed for a period of time probably affected that. Next question is from Lisa Cordasco, CHLY. Thank you. Um, I'd like to delve into the new numbers presented today because I'm a little bit confused. If I understand correctly, there are three cases being reported in the island health region, but they're cases, as I understand, that have recovered uh, or are somehow secondary cases that are now confirmed. And so can you explain that and why they're being reported now? Okay. Yes, absolutely. Um, so there are four what we call epidemiologically linked cases in the data that we uh, presented today. Um, and I chose today to add those to our data so that I could have that discussion with you all about what we meant and what it, and I could put that on the epidemiologic curve. Um, we started uh, recording those cases on May 19th. So the three on Vancouver Island, for example, were identified uh, uh, some days ago, and it's on the epi curve. You can see where the little purple um, tops of the, the curve is. Um, so they were identified earlier uh, around the 19th of May, and they have since recovered. So it was, um, it was just a way of putting that data in there in a way we could explain it. So uh, there was... Um, uh, so we ha going forward, we will be reporting those epi-linked cases every day as they show up. So that's just uh, the convention for today um, because I wanted the opportunity to explain a little more detail what we were talking about and why we were going to be reporting them going forward. Next question is from Brishti Basu, Victoria Buzz. Hi, thanks for doing this and taking my question. Um, so looking at the geographical breakdown um, presented today, do you have an opinion on how Victoria and Southern Vancouver Island appear to have escaped the worst of this pandemic even compared to less populous parts like Northern Vancouver Island? 
Yeah, it, you know, I, I think we look at different parts of the province. Um, we, we, you know, part of it is, you know, how did BC escape um, some of the things that we've seen other places? Part of it is timing and part of it was luck. Uh, and part of it was good public health and, and making sure that we um, were finding people early, that we were prepared, that we were testing as much as we could. Um, there was some challenges and I will say that there were a number of cases that we are uh, know our epi-linked cases on Vancouver Island that did not have testing done because it wasn't available early on in, in a, um, uh, an efficient way. So it is very likely that we had more impact than what is reflected by just the cases who have tested positive. And we will be needing to look at serology to help us understand what that impact was, both here on Vancouver Island, but also around the province. So, uh, you know, I've been saying this many times. We cannot say um, that this virus has not affected any community. We all have to be vigilant. We all have to be careful. And it has been in every community, whether we, um, whether we've tested everybody that may have had it or not. And that is part of the challenge we had at the period of time when testing wasn't as widely available. We also know that there was a period of time where people were traveling back to, to Canada um, where they had mild illness and were isolating at home where we didn't have the ability to test them because we were focusing on protecting our, our health care system, system and targeted testing. So um, what we have presented is, is only the people who have tested positive so far. So please don't underestimate the impact um, based on those numbers alone. And a little bit more reflection of the impact on our communities is, is in our um, public health investigations where we have 12,000 um, people uh, and families and communities that were affected, um, not just the people who were positive. Next question is from Mary Griffin, Czech News. Uh, just a question for Dr. Henry. Um, we were speaking with Paul Nursey. He's the CEO of Greater Victoria, Destination Greater Victoria. And he was talking about that uh, they're finding that reservations are cancelling. Um, so they're looking for some good news. So you mentioned it during the briefing earlier, but when could communities start to expect to really um, start receiving um, people traveling around the province, would you think? Yeah, well, I'll never put a date on it because it, it, much of it depends on what we do. Um, but we are very hopeful that we'll be moving into our next phase um, in, uh, you know, it's come the middle of June into July. Um, I am hoping myself to be able to travel very soon and, you know, and looking at booking in July. And I think this is where we, we need to in, encourage and we need to find that balance with communities. I know uh, many, uh, particularly smaller communities, um, have been very afraid around this virus and rightly so. Um, they're concerned that if it gets into their community, they won't be able to cope. We don't have the medical support. We still have a very strong network of support. We have a strong network network of public health around the province and testing is available widely on 24 hours. So we, we have many things in place that we did not have and we will continue to have that and to be watching very carefully. But if everything continues to go um, as we have been seeing, then I'm very hopeful that end of J June into July we'll be able to, um, to take those vacations that we all need. I will also encourage businesses to be flexible because there are many things that we still don't control. So having those policies that allow people to, to reschedule or change if they need to are also things that will build confidence in people for, um, for booking it at this point in time. Um, you know, we are doing okay right now and the data shows that and it's because of the work that we've been doing collectively. But we are not um, globally out of the woods. We've seen dramatic increases in uh, countries like Brazil and Russia. Um, and when there is this virus anywhere, we are all at risk. So we can't let off everything. Um, but I'm, I'm hopeful that um, we will have a summer in July and August if things keep going the way they are. Just, just to speak um, about the leadership of Dr. Henry, of, uh, of Steve Brown and our ministry, I think 
what we're trying to do, and I know there is people are always anxious, but at every turn is not to set targets that we're not going to meet. So every time we set a target, there was the start of school on June 1st to deliver and not to change and then change again. And that's part of what I think Dr. Henry has taught many of us, which is to, to, um, to uh, follow the science and so to some degree in, at every step and to not uh, set expectations that we can't meet uh, both things that we can't control. So what we can control, it seems to me, continue to control is physical distancing and all the things that we're trying to do. And that will enable all the other things. So these health measures are health measures, yes, but they're also economic measures. And I think our continued success of following an evidence-based approach, of following the direction of public health officials, of following that evidence in our decision-making builds confidence in, in and of itself. We didn't shut down sectors of the economy that other jurisdictions did because we followed the science and worked with those sectors to keep them going. And we're going to continue to do that over time. So I know people are anxious for a day, a moment, uh, a time when this and that will happen. But what we're going to do is continue to follow the evidence. That's what we've learned. That's what worked. And I think that's been uh, a really remarkable quality of our public health leaders in this time. We have time for one more question. For any reporters that didn't get a, didn't get to ask a question this afternoon, there will be a statement released later today. For recommendations on protecting families and communities from COVID-19, visit bccdc.ca. For non-medical questions about the province's COVID-19 response, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash COVID-19. And for a full listing of the provincial health officer's orders, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash PHO guidance. Last question is from Cindy Harnett, Times Colonist. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Henry. Um, can, would you mind revisiting slide 13? And, and I wonder if you can explain the origin of transmission on Vancouver Island and any explanation of why we had a concentration of the European Eastern Canada strain and the absence of others, unlike other parts of, of, of BC. And does this guide us in any way or tell us in terms of the future of what to do or not to do or what worked and didn't work? Yeah, probably not. Um, what it reflects is uh, is the travel patterns and um, the attendance uh, in some cases at uh, the conference that we were talking about. Um, so a large proportion of the cases were uh, traveling travelers who came back from countries that uh, were affected by the European strain or other parts of Canada. So it's a very broad group, but you will see that about a quarter of the the uh, Vancouver. Vancouver Island cases are, are kind of grey and that's a, a whole box of others. Um, so it does mean um, people have returned from uh, the repatriation flights to India. We know there's been, uh, uh, I won't say, not even India, but other, um, so that's a whole bucket of, of other um, places that people have come back from, other places in the US, other places in uh, um, in Latin America, I know there's been uh, people returned from cruise ships and things like that. So um, it just gives us a sense of what um, people have been connected to. And I will say as well that this is the, the gen genomic sequences are only about a, a third of the ones uh, that we have. So it is not the complete picture at this point, but it does tell us the story of what happened during that period in March. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you.